Welcome to the Healthcare Ethics and Law Podcast with me, Kira O'Brien. So welcome to the Healthcare Ethics and Law Podcast. Today we're going to talk about a really interesting topic, healthcare nudges. So some people might have heard of these, other people might know of examples of them, but may not have necessarily known the terminology for it. So it's something we're going to look at today. We're going to go through exactly what a nudge is and see how it applies to healthcare and then look at some interesting sort of discussion points around it. So to do so, we've got a special guest in, our first guest on the podcast, so pretty big news. Um, So today it's my pleasure to introduce Ilias. So Ilias is a long-time friend of mine from dental school at Liverpool and he has worked in both primary and secondary care Uh, including posts in maxillofacial surgery and special care dentistry. And little aside, he's he's a a really difficult chess player to play against. And um, we we have some uh, interesting discussions in the past, one of which was about healthcare nudges. So that's why I was really keen to get Ilias on the podcast today. So welcome, Ilias. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kira. It was a lovely introduction. I mean, I I can't beat you at chess anymore, but (laughs) I had my day and I had my time, really. Um, but yeah, healthcare nudges is, is a great topic and yeah, I'm delighted to be here to, to um, delve deeper in it um, today. Well, thanks again for coming, Elias. And one little thing before we start on the actual topic today, someone um, who listens to the podcast, uh, which is great to have some listeners, <laughs> uh, mentioned that I haven't actually introduced myself yet. So I thought it'd be interesting because I've introduced you, Elias. Why don't you introduce me to the listeners? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, um, Kira, I've known you since dental school, just like what, you, what, what, what you've said. Um, I mean, we've always enjoyed hanging out. Um, you, you're that sort of guy that is really inquisitive um, to, to, to look at what the bigger questions in life are. Um, I remember you took a year out during dental school to go in and study some philosophy, um, to intercalated um, and, and got a degree out of that as well. Um, so it's your, your multiple minds are always at work. Um, we, we we took a little time out to go to Austria one time to, to sort of relax and explore our minds and in the Austrian Alps playing chess as as those were the days that I could beat you in um, with some thought provocative music uh, such as Childish Gambino. Um, I mean, Kira's always given me some really good book recommendations as well, the, from the Malcolm Gladwells um, to the Marcus Aureliuses, um, and, and you sort of split his your time between clinical practice and and currently doing your master's in, in um, medical ethics. Um, and you've really spun that off to, to educate us all um, with this podcast and, and with all those posts that you put on Instagram your, on, on your social media platforms. Um, and you've really managed to make a very dull, dry topic of, of uh, sort of ethics and consent and um, what is it, capacity um, into something very interesting and sort of like bite-sized, tolerable um, information really. Um, so I mean, we're we're all loving your posts. Um, keep it up, and we're really excited to see how your platform grows. Really, so that that's Kira in a nutshell. That is a very good introduction. Ilias checks in the post, mate. <laughs> you pr- you promoted the Instagram. You got the website in there. You hit you hit all the you hit all the talking points. <laughs> Okay, brilliant. So, so today we're going to talk about healthcare nudges. And as you say, Elias, we've spoken about this a little bit before, um, but in the sort of interim period on my master's, I've looked into this in a bit more detail, studying it, and, and it's been really enjoyable from my point of view. But from your perspective, um, from what you've read, from what you understand, what are you aware of when it comes to these healthcare nudges and, and nudges in general, really? So I, I remember, I don't know how it came on my radar, really. Um, I read the book Nudge. Um, it, it, it was floating around. I, I can't remember who recommended it to me. Um, but it, it, it made me really think. And, and we had this discussion about how um, you can change some sort of small little things and have such a big impact. Um, so uh, what, one of the examples that they had in the book was about the urinals in one of these Scandinavian countries. They put a little fly in, in the urinal and people were, when they were peeing, they peed closer to the, they were basically aiming at a target because they had a purpose. 
um, and that nudged people to be able to um, aim onto the correct place, reducing the amount of pee that splatter that went everywhere else um, and made the toilets much more clean, cleaner, uh, much more user friendly um, and, and required less cleaning. Um, and that, that to me sounded like a fabulous idea um, to with something very small that had such a big impact, um, very low cost effective. Um, but I, I know there's lots of discussion points around around nudges and, and you, you've been telling me more about that really. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really good example of, of a nudge and it's something that a lot of people may be aware of. And as you said, nudges essentially, they implement quite a small change or a small sort of uh, modification of people's behavior. Uh, and it could be unconscious. We might not be aware of it. I mean, people that may have seen ur urinals with those sort of stickers or whatever on before probably weren't aware of what it was there for. So, so that's quite an interesting point as well. But I thought what we'll start off doing is is look at really what, what nudges are in a bit more detail from a, a conceptual point of view. And then after that, what we can do is have a little look in, in healthcare and see exactly where it's applicable. And, and I think people will be aware of nudges, but they may not have known that it was a nudge. They may not have known the terminology. So I think it'll be interesting to look at that to start off with. So essentially, as you've mentioned, Elias, nudges were um, kind of made famous almost, if you want, by by the book Nudge. Um, full title is Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth and Happiness. And that was by the authors uh, Thala and Sunstein. And again, it's it's become quite popular in the last sort of 10, 15 years. Um, Obama is quite a big fan of it and David Cameron as well. Uh, so in the UK, we actually have a behavioural insights team, which is basically the nudge factory in the UK. So they're responsible with nudges and, and their implementation. So what I thought would be interesting is that if we look through a kind of a narrative or story that, that they give at the beginning of that book and really look at how that applies to nudges, kind of break it down and go from there. So a little thought experiment for you, Elias. So what I want you to imagine is we've got a lady here called Carolyn, okay? And she's in charge of a lunchtime cafeteria. And one day she's talking to her friend who's a behavioural econo economist. So let's just say his name's Brian. And they're talking, you know, how can we help make the cafeteria um, more health conscious? How can we help people make more healthy choices? So, so Brian, the, the behavioural econ economist, says that, you know, in supermarkets, what they do to help sell certain items is they put them on the shelves at eye level. And that's shown that statistically people are more likely to buy these items when they're at eye level as opposed to if they're on a higher or lower shelf. So what Brian thinks is, well, maybe we could apply this to the cafeteria. What if we put the healthy food choices and the food choices that are better for people at eye level and then put the more unhealthy ones higher or lower? So Carolyn, she's a bit of a maverick and she thinks, do you know what, let's try this out. Um, some other methods that she's tried haven't worked out, so she thinks, I've got nothing to lose. So over the week, she puts the healthy food choices at eye level and puts the unhealthy ones on the shelves above and below. And a week later, she's analysing the results of the experiment and she's trying to see if it's really made a difference. And she can see that quite clearly there's been a, a significant increase in the number of healthy meal choices. And she really puts that down to this small change that they've made, looking at people's behaviour and how it's influenced by simply the context in which we present our meal choices. And so Dalla and Sunstein say that this is a really good example of a nudge and it shows that, as you mentioned Ilyas, it's quite a small change but it can make quite a big difference. So that's kind of an example of a nudge but what we want to do now is break it down a little bit more and and look at a bit more of the terminology. Because are you aware of much of like the sort of terminology and the theory behind it, Elias? Is that something you've you sort of heard of? Yeah, it was, it was mentioned in the book, um, but I can't remember exactly what it was. Yeah, so absolutely. So, so essentially, with these nudges, there's some terminology that they sort of bring into it. So what they claim is that essentially what this nudge is doing. So in this cafeteria, is it's using predictable behaviours that we're aware of. And it's just using it to change the context of the decision making that the people have got in regards to choosing their food. 
So what it does is it makes use, use of these known biases that we have and implements it to help influence people's decisions. So it's quite interesting. And, and Fallon and Sunstein, they call people like Carolyn choice architects. And so what that means is a choice architect is someone that they claim is responsible for organising the context in which we make decisions. But I think one thing that I particularly sort of thought about when I was learning, I'm not sure about you, Elias, is that um, it could be kind of used to influence decisions negatively. For example, in this case, they could have rearranged the food choices to put expensive foods in the in the middle one at eye level. Um, so there are like different concerns, really, that we're going to look at. But from your perspective, what's your kind of initial thought on that yeah it, when when i did hear about that this um kid's story um it did really make me think whether or not we were being manipulated in the supermarket and and everywhere else around around your life you don't know what sort of nudges people are putting into place um and, and that's obviously a, a key concern for, for for all of us we all think that we're um using our great minds and our, and our intellects to 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 make our everyday decisions but when you find out that um karen from school has moved around stuff so i take my vegetables or my banana more often um maybe i might not like the banana anymore um so 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 yeah it, it is it is something um to, uh, people's emotions are also something to think about yeah definitely it's kind of it, it does definitely makes you think that if, if these small influences can influence your des- decisions so much you know, what other uh, contexts is that being done in? But, I mean, Dal and Sunstein, they do recognise this kind of concern that people have. So they, they introduce some, uh, this, this concept or, um, so they introduce this concept, which we'll look at now, and they call this libertarian paternalism. So I'm not sure, have you heard of that, Elias? Yeah, it was, it was mentioned in the book, um, but I can't remember exactly what it was. Yeah, so we'll go through it quickly now. So essentially, the libertarian aspect is based on liberalism which you've probably heard of in a uh, political context and essentially what it claims is that within society people's autonomy should be infringed upon as little as possible in other words they should be free to make their own decisions and we shouldn't really interfere in that process so that's the first aspect of it and then we look at the second aspect which is this paternalistic part and that explains the conditions in which autonomy can be infringed upon so generally, paternalism is seen as interfering on autonomy with the justification that it prevents harm to other people or to that person who were uh, sort of infringing on their autonomy. But in this case, Thalen and Sunstein, they say that paternalism is justified because it helps people make better decisions and improve their lives. So, for example, you know, whilst we're worried that in the supermarket, they may just be presenting options for profitability. In the case of Carolyn, this counts as a nudge because it's it's helping people make better choices and sort of improving their welfare. So knowing that, you know, this is designed to help your welfare, does that help address some of your concerns that you initially had? It, it does. It does. Um, I think us as humans, we don't want to feel manipulated. I think that's a that's a that's a big thing. Um, even when after I after I heard about all of this um, nudges, I'd walk around the supermarket thinking uh, they want me to pick that one. I'm gonna pick this one. <laughs> like it it was it's a mind game, isn't it? At the end of the day, um, so it does address some of your concerns, but you're all, it, it it does. I think p- people may have that in the back of their mind thinking, am I am I not? Where has this come from? Is this my thought or is this somebody else's thought? Definitely. I think it makes you question that because a sort of personal example was when I was, when we were learning about nudges, I found out that the, you may have heard of it, it's the C25K to app, so Couch to 5K app. Yeah. So a few years ago, I think we, we actually did a 5K together, funnily enough. Yeah. A few years ago, I think you, you may have recommended that to me. So I started using that app. And within a few weeks, as as it said on, on the tin, really, I, I was able to run 5K. And I yeah. felt like, you know, actually, that's that's quite a big achievement. I hadn't done that before. Um, it had taken some discipline. And, you know, I felt, I felt quite good about it. But then when, two, three years later, when I found out that that was actually a nudge, I don't know, I'm not sure how I felt about it after that. I felt like maybe that had taken some of the sheen off, off the achievement. So it is an interesting point. And I think something that a lot of people mention is that 
you know, traditionally we think that we're quite rational making our decisions. And we think that generally we're the best people to make decisions for ourselves. We're the best place for that. We know exactly what we want, what our desires are, wishes, our preferences. But, but this kind of turns it on its head a little bit. And Dhamma and Sunstein, they they sort of acknowledge this and say that actually human beings aren't as rational as we once thought. And there's there's quite a few psychological papers that, that, that back that up as well. So that's quite an interesting thought as well. And there was um, an interesting experiment or study that was done. Um, I think it was in America where the the people running the experiment, they went into supermarkets and they had two pairs of stockings. And now these two pairs of stockings were identical in every single way. Um, but what they did is they held them up to consumers and said, which one of these stockings do you think is better? Which one would you buy? And, and can you justify that? So statistically, um, the premise of this was to show that generally, we, given the option between two things, we'll choose the one on the right-hand side. And this study was trying to prove that. And so actually, it, it really justified it because people, when they were given the two options, statistically, they chose the stocking on the right-hand side even though it's exactly the same, and then even once they asked them to justify their decision, they would then come up with justifications which obviously aren't true because it's the same stockings. For example, oh, that one looks better material, that one looks better, I think it would suit me more. So really, it's quite interesting thought that our decisions and, and our choices are so influenced by different things. So I think that's one eye-opening thing that, that this book and this concept has really taught me. And these nudges, um, I've also realised that they're everywhere and everyone's sort of taking the same way that you said our British government have their own sort of, what was it called? Um, the behavioural insight team. Um, yeah, that's it. They, they, everyone's got one and even technology now with our phones, all the notifications we get. I don't know if you notice them. The more the more that you read about nudges, the more you notice these things. Um, your Your running app may say to you, you've not run in a while. Do you want to run today? And then I'm like, I do, but I don't want to run because you're telling me to run today. <laughs> I would run because I'm running today. So sometimes it's it, you. I think even if you are going to nudge, you you have to approach it in a in a sensitive way, um, and in a way that people that people will feel comfortable with. Yeah, definitely. I mean, whenever I get that, it always sort of guilt trips me that with my fitness apps yeah, like yeah. You, you've not worked out in a while. It's judging me, man. I don't need that in my life. <laughs> But, no, but it's interesting, you know, but, um, but Dal and Sonsin, they kind of acknowledge this and they say that obviously it's quite a powerful thing at Nudge, even just with a small change can really heavily influence us. So they kind of set out a few safeguards, if you will. So they say that a Nudge generally will have to improve someone's welfare, but also it will have to improve their welfare in a way that they would agree with. So for example, the Nudge of your fitness app, you, and you know my fitness app we both know that we should be exercising three times a week we want to exercise three times a week but maybe we don't exercise three times a week you know so this is not just pushing us to exercise but it's kind of in in line with our preference it, it's in line with what we want it's kind of motivating us in a way so they say that nudges should do that as well so it shouldn't be say for example i didn't want to exercise at all and that was my preference it shouldn't sort of patronise me into doing that, that workout if I don't want to. But another couple of conditions that they have for these nudges is that there shouldn't be an option closed off. So, for example, in the, the example of Caroline, we can see that all the food choices are still there. They haven't simply gotten rid of the unhealthy food. They just rearranged the context of the decision we're making to make it more likely that we're going to choose something more healthy. So essentially what they're saying is that these biases exist. There's nothing we can do to, to get rid of them completely. Like no decision we will make is free of context. But what they say is that by implementing these, these, these tactics or these biases themselves, they're making it more likely you'll choose a better decision. So you'll be you won't be negatively affected by um, the bias that's there. For example, your your natural bias is to pick the food option at, at face height, 
we can't get rid of that. That will always be there. But what we can do is modify it in such a way that it will predispose us to make better decisions. So then that's their kind of justification um, that, it, that it helps us. And, and obviously no, no option is gotten rid of. So in that sense, it's still, it's still quite fair. And it, if you wanted to not choose the option of the nudge, say you didn't want a healthy food, you still could technically choose the unhealthy option. And and I think what makes me feel a bit more relaxed about that is the fact that if they didn't do that and they made it totally random, they'll still will be biased towards the first few options, the, the towards whatever random order they've picked. If that makes sense. Um, so if they if they put if it randomly worked out that there was chocolates at the front or bananas at the front, it would still mean it's it's there's still that sort of. Um, that that nudge but it's an undirected nudge with no intent with 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 no purpose um so if we can do that where we can nudge people to do the right thing uh, or or to do like you said the healthy option um without taking away their choice to pick the unhealthy option um then i, I think that's that's great yeah absolutely i agree with you and then they also have one more condition so so they say, firstly, you shouldn't have any option closed off for you from you, which we've seen. So, for example, in the cafeteria, cafeteria example, all options are still available. But they say that the cost of opting out from the nudge should be very low. So, for example, let's look at that, that cafeteria example again. So if someone wanted not to choose the healthy food, the, the ability to opt out of that is quite easy. You just got to look up or down and there's food options there. But say, for example, someone removed those options, they got rid of them completely and they put them to some back room. You had to go go there, request it, and it took a long time. Then that would be a sort of higher cost. And they say that you shouldn't have that because if people want to opt out of it, if the decision we think is best for them is not right, at least they can opt out and at least they have that, that opportunity to do so. Uh, and so those are the kind of the two conditions that, they, that they've got for those nudges. I kind of looked at a bit of the theory about what nudges are, but I thought it'd be interesting to look at them a bit more in a healthcare context. Are there any sort of examples that you've heard of, Elias, that, that are nudges within that, that context of either sort of in your role as a dentist or in medicine that, you, that you're aware of at all? So well, one nudge that I've heard of is um, to do with sugary content, really, um, in, in dentistry. Um, just putting it slightly, you you mentioned about eye level being the level where people actually um, engage with those items and are more likely to 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 buy them or eat them. Um, so with yeah. su sugary items such as sweets and and fizzy drinks, you could always put them at a, a higher shelf, um, something that's not on eye contact. Um, it, even in your cupboard, putting it away on the on the highest bit, just so that um, it it's not the first thing that you look at and it doesn't prompt you. To, to select it first yeah and I think that's quite an effective one because you know it's difficult to stop people drinking fizzy drinks and we know that that's quite a you know that that's such a massive cause of dental decay especially in, in younger patients so just having that slight difference can really help uh, make make big changes in people's diets so I think in those those sort of cases nudges can be really good and really effective so another example which is quite sort of topical at the moment is and um, in the book Nudge, they address this in one of the chapters, is the example of organ donation. So I'm not sure how much you know about organ donation, but essentially in, in a lot of countries, um, including the UK until recently, if you wanted to be an organ donor, you had to sign up to the organ donation register. Now, a lot of people in the UK wanted to become organ donors. However, the percentage of people that wanted to become organ donors versus the people that actually were organ donors, there was a massive disparity there. So let's just say, for example, 80% wanted to be organ donors. There's only something like 10, 20% that actually signed up. So people looked at this and thought, how can we, how can we sort of change this? Because people obviously want to be organ donors, but there's something that's causing that inertia, so they're not actually signing up. So the pe people that looked at this said that, okay, one of the big issues is that 
people have to go on the website, they have to sign in, they have to sign up, which, okay, it doesn't sound like a lot, but, but they felt that that was a massive impediment to people becoming organ donors. So what they thought in countries like Austria is that they would swap to a presumed consent. So what that means is that you would be presumed to be an organ donor or want to be an organ donor unless you signed out. So it's gone from a sign up to a sign out approach. Uh, and that's something that we've recently seen adopted in the UK only a few weeks ago. That's come into law. Um, and that's been shown to be really quite effective. And again, in line with nudges, you know, there's no option closed off for you. If you don't want to be an organ donor, you still can go down that route. And that That's well advertised and, and they don't make it difficult to do that. You just have to, once again, sign up online to register that interest. And there's not really a, a cost to opting out of it. You know, you're not fined or anything like that. You're not suddenly not allowed to have organs donated to you if you needed it. So so that really falls in line with the nudge. I mean, what do you think about that example, Elias? That, that actually reminds me a lot of my experience with organ donation. Um, I, I had always wanted to be on the list. It wasn't something that I just didn't go on the website and sign up, really. It, and every single time you renew your driving licence, that extra tick box was maybe a bit too much effort or I didn't want to think about it right now. I'll, I'll do it at some other point in the future. Uh, um, had it been the other way around where it's always where I had already been on the list, um, I, I would have just agreed with it and, and not removed myself from the list. Um, I You could technically call it a nudge. Um, when I was walking around in the city centre of Liverpool where we went to university, um, someone prompted me and asked me, do you want to sign up? And I just said yes and signed up there and then. Um, so I, I think it's quite positive. If you ask most people, they'll, they'll say, like you said, I, I'm more than happy to be on the on the list um, for organ donation. No one sees it as a bad thing. Most people would accept, most people would accept an organ if they required one um, from a donor. Yeah. And most people would be more than willing to give an organ if it was required um, uh, f for a donor. Um, so it, it makes total sense. And it's quite a positive move that the, that the UK have, have done. Absolutely, and I think you're right that just making a subtle change can make a massive difference in healthcare and in saving so many people's lives in this case. And so we just wanted to have another look at an example of, of this in healthcare. And a really famous one is in relation to missed appointments. So as we know, missed appointments cost the NHS a huge amount of money, but also a lot of time and resources that could be allocated to, to other patients. So it's a really contemporary and really big issue. And so they looked at ways in which we could improve attendance. And one way which you may have seen, Ilias, is by sending patients appointment reminders in the form of text messages. And in that text, it doesn't just tell you that you've got an appointment. It says something along the lines of, you've got an appointment at such and such time, at such and such department. And then it will have a little message below saying, Missed appointments have cost the NHS five hundred million pounds over the last year, uh, and I think that really highlights the importance of going to your appointment. And I think it sort of reaches people in a different way than just saying, you know, you've not been going to your appointments, you need to go. So I think from that perspective, it's quite encouraging, and it, and it really gives people a reason and a context really of attending that appointment. And, and a, such a small change has been shown to be quite effective, actually in reducing the amount of missed appointments. I mean, what's your experience of that in general, people missing appointments? What have you seen as different ways to try and encourage that? And what do you think of that nudge? Yeah, definitely the text message reminder um, is, is, is great. And I don't want to say it guilt trips people into coming to their appointment, but it, it sort of may, maybe brings on their civic duty to not waste taxpayers' money um, and come to your appointment. Um, I don't want to be one of those people that are contributing to, the, let's say it's 500 million that's written in the, in the text of missed appointments. Um, and it kind of makes you feel that the, the person that you're, so the doctor's a time is, is valuable, um, essentially, with, with a sort of monetary value um, next to it. Um, there's lots of times people haven't turned up for their general anaesthetics. Um, lists or for their um, for their local anaesthetic list and there's lots of individuals involved in, in that process from the anaesthetist to the surgeon to all the uh, scrub nurses um, the theatre coordinators which 
just end up standing around and there's not much to do during that one hour that they or however long their appointment had been booked for or their theatre case had been booked for. So it is quite vital to make sure that uh, we utilise all these small little um, tools that we have um, just to, 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 to get the system running more smoothly. And, and that's a saving at the end of the day because that patient will probably be rebooked some other time. Um, so if we can see them once and get them treated once, um, then, then that's a, a lot more cost effective for, 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 for the whole NHS. Um, so in, in healthcare, nudges can be, um, can be, quite, can be quite handy, really. We've presented it so far and we've kind of touched upon, but we haven't really got into a lot of depth because we'll be saving it to the next next part of the, the podcast, is some of the ethical sort of issues that, that exist with these nudges. So at the moment, we've shown them to be really good, very positive. They can help people. It's easy to opt out. But we kind of touched on some concerns where there is a little bit of a sense that they are paternalistic. We're kind of influencing people's behaviours and we kind of felt it ourselves when we've mentioned it that that can feel quite uncomfortable for people and it can feel a little bit manipulative and a lot of people that question nudges and, and whether they're ethically sound really this is one of their main concerns that it's kind of manipulating our ability to make decisions and sometimes we're not even aware of them taking place I mean a lot of the nudges we've spoken about today probably people including myself before I learned about them didn't realize they were nudges and so Dal and Sunseen they recognize this in their book and they say that whenever you make a nudge you should always be prepared as a government to justify it so long as you can justify it then it's kind of okay I mean that's a simplification of what they say but just for ease I'm sort of presenting it that way and they say that it's not manipulative because, as we've mentioned earlier, it's kind of in line with what people want. So with the gym example, we want to go to the gym and we want to exercise three times a week or whatever. Um, and in those kind of cases, I don't know, it seems it seems OK, but we can see where the manipulation may come in. It's, it's those ones that we maybe can't detect. Um, and it's the ones that maybe interfere with how we make our decisions. So what's your sort of initial thoughts on that? We'll go into it in a bit, bit, bit more detail, but that's the kind yeah. of general worry that people have. And and I think you've hit the nail on the head, really. Um, it's you don't want to feel like you've been conned. You don't want to feel like you've been manipulated. Um, and it's only, and most of us are not aware of any of these things. I mean, when I when you go to the supermarket, you don't know that. I mean, if the more that you, the more that you read about this, you start to see things. But you don't know that everyone's putting all the items they want you to buy at eye level. You don't know that the the different colours that they're using to nudge you to pick um, the discounted items or or wh whichever ones that they, they want you to go for or putting fruit and vegetables in different orders. But when you do find out, you do have that sort of oh my god, they were they 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 they've thought about this and and actually this behavioural economic slash behavioral insight teams um it, it's a big industry and it has become it has become big big money industry where um where they're doing it with everything uh, now so um it, there is a sort of trying to make sure that um you you're you're still sort of protecting your own mind and your own intellect because i think as humans we take pride in that really I'd say, let's just give it a sort of a thought experiment. If I said to you, Ilias, right, you're going to go into this supermarket. I've set it up. It's my experimental supermarket. Uh, you know, Kirits, Superstore, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And everything is positioned in such a way that it will nudge you to make certain choices. So I've put all the healthy food in the middle. Everything I want you to buy is on the right-hand side. As we saw in that other example we looked at, that will predispose you to go to the right-hand side predispose you to buying things in the middle and maybe i've thrown in a few other nudges in there as well would that make you second guess your choices when you're in there for sure definitely um i'd, I'd walk around picking up items thinking do i want this or do they want this for me which is 
it's, it's it, it 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 plays with your mind um it really does and and you want to feel content that your decision is your decision um so you you don't want to feel like someone else is manipulating you what if i then said to you okay elias i've i've rearranged the shop i've listened to your concerns i'm sorry that you feel that way what i've done is i've studied you in real depth over the last year i've studied what you bought at the supermarket what you like to eat what you've said to me you think is really good for you and now I've rearranged the shop so it's 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 not what i think is best for you it's what you, what you would have chosen anyway so i've rearranged it in that sense so it will match exactly statistically what you would buy anyway and i've put it all up on the right hand side at eye level every nudge will push you towards a choice which my statistics show that you would make anyway how do you feel in that case I still feel manipulated, which is funny because as much as it, even if it is stuff that I would have bought anyway, I still would feel like maybe I don't want it this week. Maybe I want something else. <laughs> maybe I want the different, the, I want bananas this week. I want, I, I want oranges. So it, it still would feel, I think whenever you think there's somebody else involved in your thought process, um, it, I, for me, it, I feel uneasy um, because, like, like I said, I, I, feel, I feel that we all take pride in, our, in knowing that we have a super mind, a super computer in our heads, um, which, which we manipulate and we're, we're the only ones controlling it. Um, whenever you hear about someone else doing something, um, then it kind of brings up the scenario of where you have um, a puppet and you have the strings on the, on the string master. Um, so... I, I don't know how comfortable other people would feel either. Um, or how, how would you feel? I think I'd feel a bit sort of uncomfortable about it. But here's an interesting thing. The people that defend these nudges say that, listen, maybe, maybe in my special superstore, I've made it in a certain way that biases towards you, know, you choosing things that I think is best for you, things that you think are best for you. But say we didn't do anything we just randomly put the food out there, that bias is still going to be there. You still, even if I hadn't rearranged it in any context, you would still buy the things. And let's say by accident, you know, two thirds of the food, unhealthy foods were on eye level. You go into the shop, you'd still have that bias there. So do you think you could ever overcome that? I, I the funny thing is, as much as I'm saying I would feel manipulated um and and i would i would feel uncomfortable i agree with nudges <laughs> that's the funny thing i want you to i want them to nudge us to do better and be better because i think as as all of us together as society we should encourage each other to to be better um i mean if we leave it down to the supermarkets um then they'll put things in that they'll be using these nudges anyway they'll be putting it in whatever order they feel that will increase profitability, which will increase us shopping more. Stay, they, are, they put music in the stores just to make us stay longer in the stores or walk around slower by putting slower played music. So there's always nudges. There's always different um, ways of manipulation. So whenever we think about it, we're always going to feel manipulated. Um, but maybe maybe part of it is not not to think about it, really. Yeah. I mean, Thala and Sunstein, they, they say that because you can never avoid this manipulation or they don't say manipulation. You can never avoid these biases, they call it. So these, these yeah. nudges, wouldn't you rather have someone like me who is going to make sure that the shop is Ilias friendly rather than having someone else that is either not concerned with what you would want to choose or they put it in a way that helps profitability. So given that option, would you then be sort of, happy with me to do it or would you still then question yourself you i think no doubt you you may still question yourself but you'd be more comfortable with someone that had your best interest at heart making those decisions as opposed to somebody who had other alternative agendas such as um, profitability of their store or um other 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 interests maybe selling one brand over another um because that's that's they'll get more money from that or I don't know. I, I, I just, I know that we, 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 
I don't know what we would we would always feel manipulated if we know what's going on. I think it's interesting. Is I think you kind of touched upon it earlier on, where it's almost like you'd probably rather not know in a weird way that the nudge is there, which it sounds kind of strange because you, you we always want to know what's going on and be informed. But the problem is with this nudge is if we're informed, it almost takes away its effectiveness. Because if I went into the supermarket and let's say you've turned it around, you've, you've made it what you think is best for me to eat, what's best, you know, what best choices you think I should be making. I would then second guess myself. But if you didn't tell me about it, if you just said there's an amazing shop over there, go and check it out. And I just thought, you know, it's a normal shop. And I think, oh, this is brilliant. Like they've got so many good choices here. They're all really healthy foods. And because that's what I would be aware of. It's almost kind of conflicting because the nudge would be more effective if you didn't know. But then part of you wants to know because you would want to know if you're being manipulated. I think that's quite an interesting tension there. And I'm not sure which one I would prefer, to be honest. Yeah, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head on that one again, really. It's, it's those two different aspects of, of knowing and then not knowing. Um, do you want to know or do you not want to know? <laughs> it's like the app, you know, that running app, which I said at the beginning. When I didn't know that it was a nudge, I kind of thought, oh, my God, I'm amazing at running. I'm so determined. And now that I knew it was a nudge, I kind of thought, it hadn't changed the outcome of what had happened. But I kind of felt, oh, you know, a bit of the sheen had come off it. A bit of the achievement had, had lessened, which is which is a bit of a weird one, to be honest. But it's definitely an interesting thought. With the running, did you feel like you didn't achieve it? Did you feel like somebody else did it and you were just a participant? Or what, what was it that actually made you feel uncomfortable about that one? I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. I think it's just the case that I didn't know it was a nudge. I think I think that's what it was. I think I didn't realize that actually this was designed to make me run. I wanted to run. I wanted something to make me run, but when I found out, it was a bit of a weird conflict. I mean, that's just quite a kind of a small example of of that. Um, an interesting one is in healthcare. I've heard sometimes. There's been examples of people that have said, well, we should use nudges in our consent forms. So whenever, you know, I'm sure we've had it, and this was something I was talking about to someone earlier on in the week. Sometimes patient makes decisions, patients make decisions that we may not think are in their best interest. But we, we know as clinicians, we have to respect that decision. You know, the Mental Capacity Act says that even if it's an unwise decision, someone can still make it. You know, we respect that because we respect their autonomy. Now, not just say that our autonomy is respected in this concept. But do you think if you if you were a patient and, for example, you were going in to have, you know, like a routine surgery or something, for example, and you were given all the treatment options and through a consent form and the consent form used what's called loaded language. So it would have certain sentences or bits of language in there that would predispose you to making one choice over another. Now, say say the doctor felt that that was the best choice for you, that was best for your health, and assumed that you would want what's best for your health, and you chose that option, would you feel that that's manipulative, or would you feel that that doctor has, has helped you make the best decision for you? So... I, I actually thought a lot about this, actually, um, throughout the years, because if we go back to Karen's um, uh, school cafeteria, she had the exact same options on the table, just in a different order. Right. If we look at this, and if you had the exact same options and you jumbled the order and the the choice and they're and they're 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 we, we sort of played around with it in the sense that they picked the right, but let's not say the right, because it just depends on every patient, but they picked a different option. Um, we, like we were saying a minute ago, if you, even if you put it randomly, there's still going to be bias. So does that mean there will always be bias? I mean, it's difficult. I think if, if 
I think the distinction here is that we've introduced a bias. The bias may have been random before, but we've kind of introduced it and said, in a sense, we'd be saying, we know what's best for you and we think we know what you think is best for you. So we're going to push you towards our option. Whereas in the other case... We... So go on, yeah. No, I, I'm, are we saying it's okay when it's random? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think people would have different views about it. I think they'd rather have a random choice than someone, um, than someone sort of pushing them one way or another, having that sort of intention. I think that would make some people feel uncomfortable. I mean, I think it's like the shop example. If you go to a shop and it's and no one's thought about the nudges at all, they've just put the stuff out there. You'll make your decisions. But then when I gave you the example of me rearranging it, there was something about that that made you feel uncomfortable. And the other question is, if the patient then knew that there was a nudge there, would that influence their decision where they think, oh, I don't know if they know what's best for me? Would it make them second guess themselves, in other words? Yeah, it's definitely one uh, that people will talk about and discuss for, for a long time coming. Um, and, and yeah, I think patients, I, I think they wouldn't feel the best if they felt manipulated. So the sort of added reflective process um, to it. But if you're just laying out the information, they may feel different about that. Sort of just to sort of summarise what we've discussed, really. I mean, when we looked at nudges in isolation, they seemed like a really good idea. And, and I think we both kind of supported them quite quite a lot, especially when we first spoke about them, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we kind of thought, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, this could be huge and solve so many problems. And, you know, in healthcare, we see the organ donation example where such a small change could make a massive impact to, to people's lives going forwards. And so, you know, we, we, we still in that case thought, you know, this is a really good thing. But when we look at it further, there are some I think we both feel slightly uncomfortable in some examples. And in some cases, it's difficult to exactly explain why we feel uncomfortable. But there are certainly some ethical issues there that I think we definitely need to think about in healthcare. And so I'll ask you in a moment, but certainly from my own perspective, I feel a little bit conflicted with them. I can see how they can be of massive benefit, but I can also see how they can be used to manipulate people, even if it results in making a decision that they would have made anyway, it still feels a bit uncomfortable. And I think that's what the sort of supermarket examples showed quite well, quite interestingly. I mean, what's your, your sort of summary of it and your, your feelings now? We've had this discussion about Elias. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. From, from the beginning, I was very supportive of the idea, especially hearing about the fly um, and these... It, it sounded like a very low cost, easy thing to do. Um, and it sounds like a no brainer for healthcare. Um, but as soon as you bring that sort of um, element of um, changing someone's viewpoint, that's when it becomes a bit more uneasy um, and the ethics really needs to be thought about. Um, and, and seeing how what the general public think about it as well. Um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of sort of focus groups and, and, and trials um, that go forth, um, but done in the, the correct and supportive way uh, where they can test it in sort of a safe environment um, before it before it's let out um, loose uh, in, in every hospital, really. Um, but these, these small things like the text reminder that you, that you mentioned as well, it's a really good way. Um, patients, patients can attend more readily, um, make sure there's, they save some money because they're not missing appointments. Um, and they have they have the option to cancel their appointment if they're not going to make it and it can be given to somebody else um, so yeah it, it does it does bring some sort of conflicting um, thoughts to your mind and and whether or not you're for or against it um, it sort of plays with you and yes part of me like you mentioned at one point I rather not have known about this because now I now I don't because I, I will never look at some things the same way even when I'm in the supermarket to this day I look at some things and I'm like 
<laughs> they're trying to make me pick this option <laughs> let me go for this option because i know it's the same thing um so yeah it's 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 it, it's one for 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 further research and um and and thought about really um especially when bringing it into something so sensitive as healthcare definitely definitely and i think i think yeah i think you you've hit the nail on the head the more simple nudges we feel more comfortable with and the organ donation one i don't feel that conflicted about you know i don't feel like even though i know it's a nudge i'm not too bothered about it um and maybe there's something in that because it's quite a simple one and it's it's quite it's quite over everyone can see what's going on everyone can still see there's an opt out it's just those ones where it makes you second guess your own opinion and whether the decision you're making is your own or whether it's been sort of implanted into your mind that's where it gets quite quite difficult and i think that's where we need to think about a little bit more and i think people in general would find that a bit more of a ethically maybe let's say gray area than the more simple nudges so i think that's a really interesting point <laughs> i i i think there's no perfect solution there's there's there will always there will always be there, there'll always be like as soon as you know the background behind it as soon as you know someone's designing the environment um then you start feeling that then this sort of conflicted feeling coming to mind um I think you might find it a bit easier with the example that you gave of, of sort of just teaching you that there's healthy decisions you can make. Um, but then it's up to the person to make those decisions. Um, but do we find anything wrong with them re redesigning the canteen so that we make healthier decisions? I don't know if I'm being honest, I don't know where I sit with this. <laughs> the more you think about it, the more mind boggled you become. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's been an interesting discussion. So I hope everyone listening has, um, has has maybe learned something or at least found the discussion interesting. And, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and, and thoughts about it um, with yourself. So, you know, just reflect on it and, and see what you feel comfortable with. Sometimes it's difficult to articulate the things that you may feel, um, uh, you know, a little bit of tension with, with these nudges. But, but they're definitely interesting and I think they're here to stay. So it's worth it's worth looking at and reading about. I'll be posting some more information on nudges on the website, healthcareethicsandlaw.co.uk. Um, I'll put some further reading on. So if you want to learn a bit more about these, I'll put some links to some some academic papers on there as well, um, and that that just explores a little bit of what we've discussed, and a lot of what we've discussed has come from those as well. So this is not just me coming up with all this myself. I have to give credit to a lot of people that have put in a lot of hard work. So. So you can check that out online and be sure to follow us on social media as well. On our Instagram feed, we'll be posting about some nudges as well uh, and our Facebook and Twitter. And just a disclaimer, there's no nudges on any of the social media or on the website, so you'll be safe from that. So once again, Ilyas, I just wanted to say thank you. You're our first guest on the podcast. And when I thought of um, who to get, it had to be you. And just a quick plug, I'm not getting paid to say this, Ilias does also have a podcast. Ilias, do you want to quickly mention that? No, no, I didn't know you were going to say this. I would have, I would have prepared my speech. No, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, we're we're um, we've got a dental podcast as well. It's we we care it will be on there um some sometime soon, so um you can listen out for that too. Um, it's under the tooth, um, so you can find us at under the tooth um dot com and um on Apple Podcasts and everything else. Checking that out. Ilyas, it's been an absolute pleasure. You've been our first guest. I hope that's going to be on your CV now that you've appeared on this Thank podcast. Uh, it's a huge yeah. honour to have you here. Uh, thanks once again. No, that's awesome. Uh, th thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, take care. Perfect. Well, we've got more podcasts coming up, so make sure to follow us on social media and the website as well. And we'll be also producing uh, an edited video version of this as well, and we'll be putting it on the YouTube channel. So... Thanks again for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something and it's stimulated your minds. And, and, and uh, if it's something you're interested in, 
by all means go and look into it. There's loads of literature on the topic and it's a really interesting one. So thanks again. Take care.